I think all of us are shocked that these protesters were able to breach the Capitol building. I don't think any of us expected, and certainly Capitol Hill police did not appear to have expected what happened today. Wednesday night, hours after Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol, UVA kicked off the first of its Democracy Dialogue series. Over 10,000 viewers attended this virtual event as UVA professor Larry Sabato discussed the events of the day and what led to it with guests through pre-recorded and live interviews. I apologize to all of those listening who think incorrectly that there was significant voter fraud. There was not. Biden was able to turn some critical swing states either back to Democrats or for the first time in a long time to Democrats, including Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, as well as that one congressional district in Nebraska. Joe Biden won 51 percent of the vote. And this morning, uh, we got from Georgia uh, the switching of uh, two Senate seats from the Republicans to the Democrats, and that gives Democrats 51 percent of the 100 Senate seats. So there's something about that number 51, and it's a 51 percent trifecta. Democrats have all three pieces of at least the elected branches that one needs to get things done. And now let's get some perspectives on the future of the Republican Party. He's the 55th Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, former Speaker Paul Ryan. We just want to talk about how the Democrats captured both seats in a runoff that where the Republicans normally are favored. I'm really disappointed. I didn't expect us to lose both of these. I thought we would win, frankly, both of them. It's really upsetting to people like me who care greatly about keeping our majorities. And I worry about the policy fallout that's going to come from this. You blasted the move unfolding in Congress this very day, uh, involving somewhere around 140 House members and 13 or more uh, U.S. senators, all of them Republicans, uh, trying, in essence, to stop the reading of the electoral votes in order to delegitimize Joe Biden's presidency, if I can quote a small part of this, it is difficult to conceive of a more anti-democratic and anti-conservative act than a federal intervention to overturn the results of state-certified elections and disenfranchise millions of Americans. Why did you decide to issue this statement and do it uh, over the weekend? You had to choose which do you pledge fealty to, to a man like Donald Trump or to sort of the bedrock of our democracy, our constitution? What I worry is fear and ambition were driving this. So I just felt that I, I could be helpful to colleagues in Congress who are really wringing their hands over this and worried about this, that just some clarifying statements needed to be made. I understand that, that you've been working on a post-Trump plan can you tell us a bit about that plan and what it consists of and why you think it will work? I do believe that the country does not want to go off the left cliff or far off to the right. So there is a center-right coalition for the making. And the question is, can we build a big majoritarian party that is worthy of being majoritarian? What we hope to achieve is a conservative movement that is worthy of being majoritarian in this country that is inclusive, aspirational, and that fundamentally rejects the, amor the immorality of identity politics. Democrats were going to pick up 10, 15, even more seats in the House. And now Nancy Pelosi is left with 222 for the time being, 218 is a majority. Uh, do you think she can run the House on that narrow a margin? What problems is she going to have? This is going to be very difficult. They will be unified on, you know, rule votes. They cook the rules, so they'll, they'll be unified on procedural votes. But it's going to be a centrist Congress. You don't have a choice. She'll have to rely on lots of Republican cooperation, and she'll get that on centrist issues, on issues that aren't um, ideological but are practical. Post-secondary education issues, uh, skills, you know, job training, um, national security issues you have to work on. If Joe Biden sticks to the center and, and puts that olive branch out, which would have been easier if we had divided government, then you'll, then you'll have a more productive presidency and you'll get things done. 
Joining me now to discuss the Georgia runoffs and politics in general in this crazy era is uh, first a Democratic strategist, Paul Begala. Uh, we also have our current resident scholar with the Center for Politics, Tara Setmeyer. Democrats mobilize African-Americans. It helps to have the pastor of Ebenezer running. It also helps when the Republicans attack him in a way that a lot of folks down there thought was attacking the church. That really boosted Trent. But the second piece of this, it's hard to cobble together, is suburban whites who have always been Republican. That's a revolution. When suburban whites are pairing up with African-Americans, uh, you form a, a, a pretty impressive majority in Georgia. Is this a long-term trend in Georgia that maybe is going to carry over to some other states in the South? I, I think it's a long-term trend, Larry. I, I think it's two things. The changing demography, where you, where you have lots more uh, diversity in Georgia. It's, it's almost sort of the re reverse of the Great Migration. All those African Americans who couldn't stand segregation anymore after the Second World War had moved to the North, their grandchildren are moving back. And they're moving back with master's degrees and law degrees. And I mean, it's really impressive uh, how that state has changed. But, but it's, so it's the changing demography, Asian American Pacific Islanders, great uh, large new population in Georgia. But then it's also the work. Stacey Abrams, lots of others have done the work over the last decade to, to be in the trenches, to talk to people. You can't just show up Sunday before the Tuesday election and say, hey, remember me. Uh, and so the long-term effort that, uh, that Georgia Democrats have made has been really impressive. It's, it's finally paying off. Tara, when you saw that Democrats won both of those Senate seats and took control of the U.S. Senate, what was your reaction? The political gods have finally decided to try to make this right because our democracy was literally on life support before November. To see Georgia go blue, not once, but twice, it is a political earthquake for the Republican Party. What do we need to do to reduce polarization and increase the chances that we can, we can all help govern this great country? It means that the Democrats now in, in the driver's seat, it's incumbent on them, on us, to reach out and yes, to reach out to Republicans and to compromise. We've had, we've been schooled by Trump to believe that politics is only about your base. And we all talk about the Trump base and it's impressive, it is. But this is a, a vast diverse democracy and we've got to have inclusion and diversity. Nancy Pelosi has it right, this is her favorite saying. She says, diversity is our strength and unity is our power. So you got to be both. It's hard to be unified when you're diverse, but that's the challenge for America. And I, I do. I think Biden is a perfect leader for this time. Republicans and, and moderate Republicans were not OK with Donald Trump, but they still wanted divided government with Republicans having some control of something to balance things out. But they need to realize that that's not the majority of the country. The country is still a center left, center right country. I think they need to decide how they want Joe Biden's uh, presidencies, particularly in the beginning, how they want his presidency to go. Joining me now is a great friend of uh, the university and the Center for Politics, Margaret Brennan. I think all of us are shocked that these protesters were able to breach the Capitol building. Congressional leadership was rushed out. The vice president himself was put in direct uh, line of danger by Trump supporters today. I think the public has gotten very confused. I was listening to some networks today and some conservative networks and how they covered it. And they were saying, well, you know, some people showed up at the Capitol today protesting and thought they could change the outcome of election. Well, they thought that because they were told that it was a possibility that they could do so. Um, and, and that these ideas that have been floated weren't completely laid bare for what they are, uh, which is, you know, not based on fact and not procedurally even possible um, in, in Congress. So I just, uh, as a journalist, I'm frustrated that the public was left confused to a certain degree. Let's bring in our next guest, uh, a longtime friend, a seasoned TV journalist on CNN, Don Lemon. I just want your reaction before we get into the details. What, what did you think? How, how are you reacting to it? These are not protesters. These are anarchists. These are people who are trying to subvert justice, and these are people who are um, who are really subverting our democracy. This is a valuable lesson that we should listen to content and context uh, rather than uh, the loudest voice and uh, the, and the the person who is the most entertaining. We have to be very careful about who we give our platforms to 
and who we give the biggest platform in the world to, and that is the Oval Office. I think it's incumbent upon the media not to give him so much oxygen. I think the more you starve him of oxygen, the less relevant he will become, the smaller his platform will be, and he will continue, I believe, to speak to a dwindling echo chamber, I believe. It is not a right to be on CNN or to be on any news network. It is a privilege. And if you have the privilege of speaking directly to the American people, then you should at least be honest with them and not lie to them. We have uh, another great Washington journalist coming on with us in just a second. This day at times um, had me on the verge of tears watching what was going on, watching those those people with Trump flags and far more blue Trump flags than American flags bursting through the police lines and into the Capitol building, taking over the uh, the Senate chamber. Uh, it's one of the images that just blew me away. That it was, was one of these rioters going in to Nancy Pelosi's office and, and putting his feet on her desk. That was horrible, uh, just to hear you describe it. Apparently, there are contingency plans for getting him out of the White House. Can you tell us anything about that, or is that proprietary? I just spoke to one of his real allies uh, who's still talking to him. We talked to him today, had a very angry conversation with him today, you know, about whether or not he can actually serve out the rest of this term and, and the 25th Amendment. These are real discussions among people that are close to him. They say that he has lost his mind. Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey has joined us. What happened today is completely unspeakable and unacceptable. My last guest, he's the former director of cybersecurity with the Department of Homeland Security. I'm neither blessed nor cursed to receive intelligence briefings anymore. I suspect there will be uh, an investigation into what the breakdown was uh, with, with Capitol Police and, and other law enforcement elements. Senator Ron Johnson said you testified at his committee that there might have been some voter fraud. That was a marathon hearing uh, by my experience over three hours. And so you take a lot of that conversation over three and a half hours, then you consolidate it down into a, you know, a five minute hit with Chuck Todd, and you don't always get the full context and the truth. What we were focused on was the security of the systems that you as voters use to, to cast your vote sometimes, uh, that are used to count the vote, to process the, the registrations all of that. And uh, so from a security perspective, absolutely most secure election in, in, in modern history. We know that because we have been working on it for four years. We had the advantage of four years of preparation. The prior administration had about four months. And that's law enforcement, that's OFBI, that's the intelligence community. We were looking out, we were looking in, and there was no evidence whatsoever of any sort of compromise of the vote casting, counting, and certification process. Now, what, the, the, what we did was issue on November 12th a, a statement of a, uh, a host of folks that were involved in uh, the, the vote administration, the election administration process. And, you know, we we're specifically talking about the cybersecurity piece, but there were stakeholders, state and local election officials who said, you know, there's no widespread fraud. This Russian hack, this gigantic Russian hack, uh, can you tell us any more about it? And did was there any piece of it that affected elections? The reason we know that there was no intersection of this election of this this hack with the election systems is because we have the paper ballots, we have the receipts, and even if a, uh, the Russians were able to get into any sort of election systems, when you vote on a piece of paper and you count it three times like you did in Georgia, including manual hand recounts, that's how you know that the vote was secure. So we know it's secure because we have the paper.